speaker this morning is a native of California and a Dominican friar of the province of St. Joseph in the United States. After his ordination to the priesthood, Father Ezra Sullivan went to Rome, where he now serves as professor of moral, philo moral theology and psychology at the University of St. Thomas Aquinas, commonly known as the Angelicum. He has published scholarly articles on bioethics, theology, and Catholic history, and is the recent author of two books on the Thomistic account of habits, as well as having a, a research interest in our topic today, uh, the, the, the uh, relationship between Christianity and, uh, and Hinduism and Buddhism. So it's a pleasure to welcome Father Ezra back to the ICC this morning uh, for this lecture. Thank you for joining us, Father. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Well, why don't we begin with a prayer? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. This talk is a Catholic view of Hinduism. And of course, this is always a, a, an amazingly complex and difficult issue to address. First, because I didn't grow up Hindu, although I was from California, that's not quite the same thing. And, and also because what Hindu is, is a complex and well-disputed issue. So in this lecture, I have um, a number of slides and I'll invite you to, to follow along either with my voice or the pictures. For those who uh, cannot see the slides, I see a couple who are joining us in the car or who are listening with audio, I will try to describe what is shown. But of course, a picture is worth a thousand words, so I can't belabor it too much. Often people think of Hinduism as the religion of India. And if we look at statistics of people who call themselves Hindu, we'll notice that after Christianity and Islam, Hinduism is the world's third largest religion. Over 1 billion people follow some form of Hinduism. And so that comprises about 15 to 16% of the global population. Now, this population, though, is not evenly dispersed. More than 99% of people who call themselves Hindu reside in India and the surrounding regions. We have Nepal, where the state is legally bound to protect uh, Hinduism in some way, and there's also Bangladesh. In the United States, the, um, the understanding of, of Hinduism is they're about 2 million, uh, 2.5 million followers. Now in this first slide, what we notice is how big is India? And I've, I've overlapped it with uh, Europe just to get an idea. And you'll notice that India would encompass all of Italy and most of Western Europe. And you see it, it would overlap with Ukraine a bit. And um, so it's quite large just as a land mass. It gives us an idea of it's a geographical setting. Now, it's large, and this is why sometimes it's called a subcontinent. Now let's move on to the next slide. There we go. Now, this is a view of ancient India, and I think it's very important to understand the history of Hinduism by also understanding the, the general geography of India, as well as how people came to populate this subcontinent. Although we can't see it in this slide, uh, we'll stay with this slide, but although we can't see it, India is surrounded by mountains. You'll see in the upper right-hand corner the Himalayas. And that, of course, is where we have the tallest mountain range in the world with um, snow-covered caps that are almost impassable. And then to the left-hand side, where there would be Pakistan and then further on Afghanistan, there's also a mountain range. So essentially, India is, is its own isolated landmass. It's practically impassable to the northeast, 
and then to the northwest, it's quite difficult to enter. The red line in the map represents the Indus River. And this is a very important boundary for India. Essentially, everything south of the Indus River would be counted as classic India. And then the blue line is the Ganges River, which has an important element in Hinduism as they consider it divine. And so there are many rituals that are associated with purification and with burial. In fact, they will put bodies into the Ganges after they've died in order to, as it were, send them off into eternity. So if India is impassable in its boundaries, we notice also there it's sticking out into the ocean. According to some of the oldest people of India called the Dravidians, their tradition says that they did not come from Africa. Instead, they said that there was a sunken landmass to the south of the southernmost point of India, what is now called Cape Cormoran. The date they give for the sinking of their land is more than 10,000 years before the time of Christ. And now part of their most ancient poetry is supposed to have been written in this submerged territory. They say, and we can move to the next slide. There we go. They say that they came up through the south, and you see there's the sign says Dravidians. And they have actually, interestingly enough, some genetic similarities with the first peoples of Australia, as well as some of the hill tribes around Vietnam and Cambodia. These people, the Dravidians, often live in forests, the high plateaus, and they speak a language which comes from the Paleolithic era, quite old. Often they're hunter-gatherers, and their their society is typically patri uh, matriarchal. Nowadays, they form uh, certain workers' castes, and they have an extremely ancient oral tradition. Now, the reason why I bring this up is because the history of Hinduism is the confrontation of some of the peoples from the south of India with a group that came in through the north. So, from the northwest, there's an open door between some of the mountains and it's related to this Indus River. So let's understand where does the name Hindu come from? And this is a picture of the people called the Aryans who were said to have originated there, you can see in uh, somewhat Eastern Europe. And then they came down, the red lines show their migration patterns all the way through to the Indus River. Let's go to the next slide and see a focus on that migration pattern. There we go. So that it's called the Indo-Aryan migration. And as you can see, they cross over the Indus River, they make their way about to the Ganges, and they start to settle in that upper north portion of India. These people, the Aryans, they were the ones who helped to coin the term Sindhu. Sindhu was the name of the river that runs from the foothills of the Himalayas down to the Arabian Sea, which, as I said, was a natural boundary between this peninsular area to the east and then the western plains and eventual mountain ranges. The ancient texts called the Vedas that were held as sacred, and we'll talk about those later, uses the word Sindhu to describe this particular river. And the people who lived around it were, were called the Sindhus. Now, what's interesting is uh, later on, a few centuries later, we have the Greeks come. And they give a word to the same people living at the same river, and they called them the Indikoi. You can see it has the same root, the I-N-D. And these Greeks, when they came there, first with Alexander the Great, of course, Macedonian, Later on, they made their way all the way to the Indus River, and then Alexander, he could not conquer the peoples there, and so they had to escape by means of the, <laughs> the river down to the Arabian Peninsula. Now, when they described these Indikoi, some later Greek historians said that they found men who were clothed only in loincloths, who would be in different postures, standing, sitting, lying down, motionless until evening. Sometimes they would stand on one leg or hold a piece of wood in their hands. And they would do this because they said the oldest and wisest among them were those who learned how to remove pleasure and pain from the soul by means of these exercises. After the Greeks came, then the Persians and the Muslims came. 
And they gave to the word, uh, the, the word of the same people, the induce. And so you can see how this etymology of the word starts to show us also about how India encountered other peoples from the Northwest. Under Darius I, they wanted to, the Persians wanted to identify the people who lived near this river. Where did they live? What did they look like? And they noticed they, were, they weren't quite Persian, but they were also distinct from the peoples from the south of India. The Muslims described this country as Al-Hind, which referred to people who were neither Muslims nor Buddhists. When the British eventually came and they established colonies in India, they asked themselves a question. Can there be a name for the, for the system of religion that is neither Islamic nor Judas, Judaism nor Christianity? And their answer was to use the word that had been used for centuries, namely Hinduism. And there we can see this historical connection in this word to these ancient cultures, which had first encountered the subcontinent. But what is Hinduism? We might say as a basic answer that it's a complex reality of locality, the river, culture, language, as well as religious practice. And it's interesting because for some time, the Indians called themselves Sanatanis, which means this people who follow the eternal order. The word Sanatana is, has the same root as the word saint in our language. And this idea is that there's some kind of connection to the eternal, to an absolute deity, as well as practices and a way of life. So you can see that even the way that Indians understood themselves had to do with religion and it had to do with their localized culture. Some people say that Hinduism is a way of life. In the present Indian government, everyone, everyone in India is automatically a Hindu unless he or she specifically claims adherence to another religion. So you can see that location in a country and belonging to a particular culture and religion are really bound up in this area. Although sometimes people will say Hinduism isn't one religion, it's a collection of religions. Sometimes they, they will say it's actually a shared tradition, religions that continually influence each other through the ages and have jointly contributed to forming the culture of this subcontinent. Other people will say, well, despite these seeming inconsistencies, Hindu actually, Hinduism actually is one whole. And in fact, they'll even say that one of the markers of it is the caste system. Whereas others say, well, the caste system is now illegal. So that can't be <laughs> our unifying principle. Now, I would say that with all of these different ways of understanding Hinduism, what we start to notice then is this is part of Hinduism itself, is its complexity. There is a bewildering, a bewildering number of different schools, beliefs, and resultant practices. And we see this both in the temples in which uh, different deities are worshipped, as well as in the great number of writings. One famous Indologist, someone who studies India, as well as Hinduism, says there's no Hindu canon the way there is the Bible. Ideas about every issue of faith and lifestyle, from vegetarianism to nonviolence to belief in reincarnation, well, these are all subjects of debate. So is there an essence to Hinduism? Is there some changeless ground in which Hinduism is rooted? Well, there's an image that some Indologists use that I think is very helpful. And this is the great banyan tree. In Calcutta, there's a tree of the species, the banyan, and it has a very interesting kind of characteristic. If you'll notice, it has a very wide root uh, trunk and then from those branches, the branches actually sink down vertically and they become so thick that they seem to be individual tree trunks. So an ancient banyan tree like this one, which is over 200 years old, it covers about four acres, a single tree. And yet it's vigorous as ever. Each time it has a new branch in order to maintain those branches, it, it has a root that, that goes down directly vertically to the ground and then starts to grow itself widely until that gives itself new branches. And so this is why some people will say, well, Hinduism is like this. It has an ancient root, 
has many branches. Sometimes they're difficult to distinguish from others. Other times they're easier. But there's a single kind of spirit or life sap, a sort of force that moves all through the different branches of Hinduism. And there we'll see this is called the Great Banyan Tree of Calcutta, which they say actually was planted by a British man uh, when he was trying to build a garden that would collect some of the most valuable and precious plants of India. So it's an interesting thing that a Westerner is using this ancient tree both to preserve India, but now it's used in order to symbolize India's greatest religion. So there you have it. So what we find then is that although it's true that many things are up for debate within the Hindu world, nevertheless, there's some things that most Hindus have in common. And that's what I'm going to mostly talk about today. So granted, there are lots of caveats to what I'm about to talk about. I'm speaking about the large mass, the main trunk of that banyan tree. And although there will be branches, or even branches of Hinduism that claim to be atheistic, we won't talk about those in any great detail whatsoever. The root of the Hindu understanding and way of life as it presently exists can be traced back to the Vedas. The classic Hindu text, there we go, this, the Vedas. This is just what, what it looks like. And um, these actually stretch back well before the time of Christ. Some of the Vedas uh, had been recited orally for thousands of years before they were then collected and written down, and the oldest would be more than 3,000 years old. So they're quite ancient and they're revered, and these, and these texts are seen as sacred and divine revelation. And so through time, commentators were meticulous both in memorizing certain phrases within these ancient texts, as well as commenting upon them and producing new texts and new interpretive schools. These Vedic rituals, uh, they would be first pronounced orally. They would be memorized by young priests of the Brahmin caste, typically, who entered monasteries as early as five or six years old. In the past, these schools were financially supported by kings and monasteries, and, um, and now, though, they often have actually government sponsors. So Vedas are their starting point. Although the majority of Hindus accept these as revelation, even the ones who reject them as revelation, nevertheless, use them as a starting point of their discussion. And they would say, well, here is where we disagree with the Vedas. So what is a Veda? <laughs> well, the word Veda comes from the root vid, which means to know in Sanskrit. And it's related to this idea of seeing. And so it's, re it's, it's retained in English words such as visual and video. The Vedas, as I said, were hymns spoken by Br Brahmanic priests in the context of some ritual action. The oldest and perhaps most famous of the Vedas is called the Rig Veda. Rig Vedic hymns have a sort of poetic beauty, and they're seen as this seedbed in which in talking about the gods and in describing ritual actions, include, including a famous horse sacrifice, then they would say that this becomes that upon which people start to reflect. So the Vedas are often uh, understood by historians as the, the hymns of the Aryans who came down from the north of India, who came and settled the area, and eventually themselves took over the rest of India uh, by means of the various monarchies. And so the Rig Veda becomes the first instantiation of the Aryan understanding of religion and of life. Other Vedas are, um, they're actually used even now within families and in schools. So there's one called the Yajur Veda, and there's another called the Sama Veda. And these are seen more as the functional or meditative aspects of ritual. And so some of these actually have prayers that a family will say together. And, um, and they have chants that have been written and associated with them. And one woman who converted from uh, Hinduism to Greek Orthodoxy, she said that listening to the Vedic chants is somewhat comparable to hearing Byzantine chant, to, ha to have an idea of what it's like to have this all-encompassing 
music of a sacred text. There's one more Veda, which stands somewhat outside the system, and this consists primarily of hymns, as well as spells, and even magical incantations, and sometimes healing recipes. So you can see then that, that the Vedas are primarily related to a polytheistic understanding of the world and the physical sacrifices that would be performed by the Brahmin priests, and then some of the prayers that are associated with uh, the, the, the lay people. In time, other literature starts to develop. And here I gave uh, the example in the next slide of the Mahabharata and the Ramayana. And these are two of the greatest epics within the, uh, within the worldview of Hinduism. So um, it's, it's important to note that um, there are many different versions of these. <laughs> so although the, the ones in Sanskrit are considered to be the most important, and they're the ones that uh, often are translated, nevertheless, there are many in different languages, such as Tamil, Bangla, and most of the other languages of India. Okay, so what are these about? Well, um, the Mahabharata, sometimes called the Fifth Veda, is a, an epic poem called the longest poem ever written. It's about two million words. In the modern English translation, it's 10 volumes. And the main plot is, um, it, it involves the fight between two different groups of cousins. But really they say, um, there's a saying in India, which is, if it's not in the Mahabharata, it doesn't exist. I mean, I, that's a bit of an exaggeration because Christ isn't in there, but, uh, but there's a lot in there. So um, they, have, they have expositions on the nature of the universe. They have ancient myths, philosophical and religious reflections, accounts of rituals and pilgrimages. There are ethical sayings, and there's even a whole book that's dedicated to political theory. So over time, as it, it was written, more and more stuff was added to this to be a sort of compilation of all of the ancient Hindu theory outside of the Vedas. The Mahabharata has inspired comic books, cartoons, movies, novels. Every Indian would know the basic plot of all of these. And this, the uh, portion of the Mahabharata, which is most important, is the Bhagavad Gita. And that's the picture on the left. So in the picture on the left, it, there's a sort of pause in the battle. And um, there's this god called Krishna, who is said to be an avatar of the god Vishnu. And he appears to Arjuna, the archer. So you can see there's Krishna in the bottom. He has the blue skin. He's pointing. And then there's Arjuna, the archer, above him. And, and, and the basic setting of the Bhagavad Gita is that uh, Arjuna doesn't want to go and fight his cousin. So you can see his cousin raising his hand saying, don't shoot me. And um, Arjuna has this sort of this bout of conscience. Well, this God appears to him and says, you must do your duty. And then he goes on and he explains the nature of duty and of life and ultimate liberation from this world. And the means of liberation, he says, is yoga. Yoga is seen as the way to control the body as well as the soul in order to perform your duties. Okay, next we have the Ramayana. And the Ramayana, this uh, is a shorter epic, and it's basically about this fellow in the center. There's Rama, and his wife is stolen by a demon god, and with the help of a monkey god on the right, uh, Hanuman, he goes and rescues his wife. And it's sort of this you know, romantic epic that, once again, all Indians would be familiar with. Okay, we're gonna to have to move more quickly because <laughs> I see Hinduism is quite complicated. Okay, next slide. <laughs> Many other works exist. Uh, the Puranas are not considered to be canonical texts, but once again, there are um, there's 13 main ones and then there's lots of other ones. And they become, uh, as it were, a collection of history and poetry, um, ethics and stories. The Upanishads are important because basically what happens with all religion, and this is kind of universal, this includes Judaism and Christianity, is the earliest forms are related to ritual sacrifice and the sacrifice of animals. And if you notice, say, with the prophets in, um, in the Old Testament, they start to emphasize the spiritual elements. God says to the prophet, 
to David, I desire obedience, not sacrifice. And so the same movement actually starts to happen within uh, Hinduism. Namely, you have the horse sacrifice, which is seen as the typifying way of relating to the gods in the Vedas. And then the Upanishads, they try to spiritualize it. They talk about offering yourself to the gods as a sacrifice. So the Upanishads are of a, more of a philosophical reflection on the nature of the world. Sutras, for their part, um, they are, the word sutra literally is a string. So like we have the word in English, suture, when you, when you um, have uh, a surgery, then they sew you up. So a sutra is basically a string of small aphorisms that are related to some idea. And the most famous of those is the Yoga Sutra attributed to a fellow named Patanjali. So the Yoga Sutra uh, is a series of small little sayings all about the nature of yoga and of life. And then through time, people have commented upon these. So this is seen as a Hindu text. Now, Hinduism is not primarily a religion of the book, unlike say um, Islam. Rather, we would try to emphasize how for Hindus, it's not any particular text, nor even necessarily some particular belief that shapes the primary center of their psychology. Rather, there are certain goals of life that shape their approach to the world. And these goals actually, we would say, have more of a controlling force. And so these goals are four. The Dharmic goals of life. And the first is Dharma. And if you notice, I don't have a translation for that. Um, basically, we could say that Dharma is understood both as the law which controls the universe, but it's also the law for the individual. You see, for Hindus, moral law and physical law exist before the world began and expresses the nature of things and of beings. This dharma governs all of our conduct and it governs the way that plants grow, the way that stars and planets move, and, and it's also a law that all human and animal, animal societies obey. So the Dharma then is the sort of all pervasive controlling order. And in order to live well, you have to live according to this idea of Dharma. So ethics then is primarily the not related to any kind of belief, but a sort of a conduct of living within your state of life, your particular role within the universe. Everything has a place and you have your place. You have to live according to the Dharma that is made for you. And if you live according to this, according to your physical dharma and your mental dharma, then you will then achieve your destiny and have your purpose within this cosmic order. The next kind of goal is called artha, which can be translated as worldly success, wealth, material goods, power. In India, the acquisition of material goods is understood as a worthy goal of human beings. And the reason why is because it's recognized that people need material goods and the stability of goods acquired allows for the stability of society and therefore to free you up to pursue higher goals. So they have a whole science that they call the Artha Shastra, which is the science of means or of uh, gaining worldly success. And so within this sort of success-based um, idea, social organization then comes about because of these economic goals according to each person's caste and their particular role within ethics and religion and then their social standing. So, so it, it, it's a bit different from um, you know, Christ who warns us about the rich man who um, had difficulty you know, achieving heaven and who, you know, tells us to have a kind of a care for the poor and the widow. We see this even in the, in the Old Testament. And then in the New Testament, Christ himself, you know, he, he um, sets aside worldly goods in order to focus on the spiritual. And, um, and he's supposed to be a model for all of us. So there's, there's not quite a parallel with the Hindu acceptance of material goods and success within the, with the, within the Christian world. Um, the next, perhaps, is even more surprising. And this is the goal of kama, which means pleasure. So again, within this idea, 
the body has its needs. When a bodily need is satisfied, that leads to comma or pleasure. And what's interesting is that this is seen as a right goal for Hindus. Pleasure is a motive that makes us move forward. And often, sometimes they will even say that uh, comma, pleasure, is above virtue. Because if we didn't have pleasure as our goal, we wouldn't even do anything. <laughs> and so they see pleasure as the motive force behind doing the right thing. So they say that pleasure should never make us forget um, uh, that we have, of course, this larger goal, which is the next illumination. But they say virtue must not make us forget pleasure. And so within this, uh, the Hindus have uh, an extensive approach to the understanding of reproduction and the sexual acts. For them, the union of man and woman is the very symbol of the divine being and its creative potential. This union is the beginning and end of existence. And so for them, the sexual act can be raised to the level of a ritual. And so in Hindu temples, there are many erotic statues. You'll see many erotic pictures. There are treaties that are written. And there are even rooms that are dedicated to intercourse in the houses of rich people. Temple prostitution is something that is understood and widely accepted, as well as uh, prostitution as a ritual action. Only the renunciate, the one who gives up all of worldly goods, is the one who uh, is purely celibate. And so they don't have comma as uh, a direct physical goal. And so it's quite interesting then that the Hindu understanding of this has this proliferation then of erotic imagery and so on, despite the fact that they're modest about um, displaying eroticism per se, say in movies, nevertheless, it's a theme that pervades the, the culture. Finally, the fourth goal is called moksha. And this could be understood either as uh, illumination of the intellect or liberation. Probably liberation is a, is a better understanding. The ultimate aim of life is to escape this worldly existence. And in fact, to cease your individual existence, to be dissolved in absolute being, which is called Brahman. The created world must, must one day disappear. Sometimes it's depicted as a dream. And in order to be dissolved in this night of sleep, we have to have moksha as our goal. The world is going to vanish, not only this world, but the eternal series of worlds will one day vanish. And so the person who wants to escape this endless cycle more quickly needs to himself endure and then move through this world. To the very extent that they're divinely inspired, a religion from this perspective is still, well, they see something as holding man down, as being an instrument only to hold man, to help him to achieve a little bit of enlightenment. But ultimately, it's interesting, it's interesting that this liberation, this moksha, is a liberation also from all religious actions, rights, and even ethics. So, so there's a way in which, and we're going to see this at the end, that, um, that everything that I've described so far is seen as illusory. And this is dangerous because now we don't want to be even too attached to those other goals. We have to be liberated also from those lower goals. But in order to do that, we have to practice what they call bhakti, which is religious ritual. And so here we get to the question of, well, what is a religion? Is Hinduism a religion? What is it? Well, according to St. Thomas Aquinas, religion is a virtue whereby one worships the one true God. So Hinduism can't fit into that because they don't worship one God and they're not worshiping rightly. But the idea of religion from a sociological perspective perhaps can help us to understand Hinduism as a religion or a family of religions. The sociologist uh, Emil Durkheim he says that the essential stuff out of which religion is made includes beliefs, especially those that separate the sacred and the profane. He says cultic ritual that enact the belief ceremonially. And then finally, a hierarchical community whereby the faithful and those who perform the rituals are distinguished. 
And this certainly is the case for Hinduism, as we saw. There are some beliefs that, although disputed, are accepted by most Hindus, and those include the four goals. We have cultic rites, and those are related to different gods, as we were about to see. And then there's a hierarchical community. We're going to see this too, between the upper caste and then all the others. But first, let's look at these gods and see uh, what does Hinduism say about them? Well, there is a, a saying within Hinduism that there are 330 million gods. But it's, it's helpful to remember that despite this polytheism, many regard these gods as manifestations of a single divine being who's impersonal. So they don't see God ultimately as Father, Son, or Holy Spirit, or God as having a, uh, an intellect and a will, as we would say. They, it's, it's a divine being that pervades all things, that manifests itself. You can almost imagine it like a mist that coalesces within a single place. And this is what they understand as these particular gods. So each god within Hinduism is going to be distinguished by a particular posture, by some kind of symbol, a weapon, a vehicle, sometimes food. And, um, and we'll notice that if you go into a Hindu home, they often have a little prayer room or a corner or a shelf that has little images of gods, perhaps a picture of a guru, maybe a lamp. And um, there's often a ritual called the puja, which is performed before these images. And, and I can remember going into uh, homes of my Hindu friends, and they both had pictures like this one of Vishnu, as well as of Christ. Because for them, Jesus is one God among many. He's, he's a God who was brought by the West and now can bring certain kinds of um, grace and power. So Christ is considered to be, by some Hindus, as the God that brings us kindness and loving our neighbor. But let's go back to Vishnu for a second. In the picture, we see Vishnu. He has blue skin, four arms. There's a kind of a shell around his head. Oh, did you notice the shells are made of snakes? Snakes are a very big image within all of the divinities of Hinduism. It's kind of astonishing when we think about the snake in the Garden of Eden, which is said to have been you know, the symbol of Satan. So, you know, of course, from a Jewish or Christian perspective, the snake as a divinity indicates an evil divinity. And of course, not equal to God as some sort of contra power, but rather a fallen angel who has the desire to deceive souls. Nevertheless, we'll, we'll notice that's, that's not the way they understand um, the snake within Hinduism, but it is a striking pervasive symbol for them. Now, just to give you an idea of how to uh, read a, um, a Hindu picture, what each of these, each of these gestures and, and portions of the picture all have a symbolic significance. So in the right hand, um, right for us. There's a conch shell, and this is said to have been blown by the god in order to have the vibration which goes throughout the universe. So when we talk about good vibes, they think that often that's Vishnu. On the uh, left hand, left for us, you see there's this little disc that he's twirling with his fingers. Well, this signifies the chakra or the universal mind or awareness. So when people talk about chakra power, that's Vishnu sort of affecting that with his own power. The mace in the lower left hand is a symbol of cosmic intellect or knowledge. It's also associated with time as a destroyer. And then in the other hand, we notice a lotus, and it's being held downwards. And this is a symbol of the changing of the nature of the universe. And so Vishnu then is seen as one of the chief gods. He has these characteristics. And, and you can see then that when they're looking at the picture, this has a deeper meaning than it has for us. And we have to understand that for uh, a Hindu looking upon this, they may be asking for particular offerings, a, a kind of change in their life based on the things they think that God can offer. So let's look at another one. Here's Shiva an enormous statue. Some of the biggest statues in the world actually are either of Christ or of Shiva. This one I think is only 40 feet tall. And um, what we'll notice here is he's in a posture often associated with yoga. 
he's seated on a tiger skin. You can kind of see the tiger there in the middle of his crossed legs. And that's supposed to signify the power of a yogi over nature. Shiva is said to have been the first yogi who gave yoga to the world. He has hair that's wavy. They say that represents the Ganges River. He has uh, arms. I mean, I can go through each arm, but notice one has the trident. And this is because Shiva is called the creator, the preserver, and the destroyer. In the next one, uh, next slide, we'll see uh, Shiva's so-called consort. Her name is Shakti. This just gives us a view of a temple of Shakti. And um, Hindu temples are quite elaborate, complex. Their ornamentation is beautiful. And it reminds us somewhat of a Gothic cathedral. In, in, in the sense of the towers that they have, the spires, as well as the ornamentations on the outside of gargoyles and other figures that are revered. If we go to Shakti herself, um, next slide. She's sometimes seen as ben benevolent, but other times she comes in the form of Kali. Uh, I remember just here a little anecdote. I was, um, when I was in Delhi, I uh, was walking past a guy who, who had a cart and on the cart, there were little figurines of idols. And you know, they were like maybe three, uh, three or four inches tall. And one of them had a picture of this. And, and I asked the guy, I did not want to touch it. I just said, oh, uh, is that Kali? And he says, yes. He says, Kali is good for attacking your enemies. You buy this, you pray to Kali, she will definitely remove your enemy from your life. You can see that she chops off the heads of the enemies. You see how she's stepping on another one? There's a skull made out of severed heads that surrounds her. She wears it like a garland. All of this is meant to symbolize the destructive power, the danger of women, the, the destructive mother that Carl Jung talks about. This is, this is Kali. And so you know, some feminists have actually taken Kali as their own symbol, and they've said that you know, I am woman, hear me roar like the goddess Kali. There are books about this very theme and topic. It's quite interesting how it enters uh, Western discourse. And then finally, um, to, to finish up our understanding of the Hindu pantheon, we can't go through all 330 million gods. Um, there's one that's called the liberal form of Hinduism, and it's called smartism. And yes, it does have the same root as for us the word smart. And um, for them, though, the, the SMRT has a root in Sanskrit, more has to do with memory. In any case, uh, smartism says you can choose whatever god you like. They don't argue as to whether Vishnu is higher than Shiva or Shakti is the one above all. They say you can worship any of these five gods, and here are some. Uh, Shiva is actually in there and shows so Shakti. As well as the center one, there's Ganesh, the elephant-headed cute baby god. But uh, watch out, he's also a demon. So uh, according to smartism, though, it's, it's not a problem to worship any of those. If we understand this correctly, however, we have to recognize that Hindus do not all worship the same. And here we have to move to this idea of caste. As opposed to Christianity, where we say, in Christ, there is neither Jew nor Christian, or Jew nor Gentile, there's neither Greek nor barbarian, neither slave nor free, well, that's not the case in Hinduism. In the Catholic Church, you can enter the Catholic Church and you can be seated wherever you like. You each has equal access to the Holy Eucharist if you're in the state of grace. And so there's this sense of the equality of believers, both because of our nature being made in the image and likeness of God, as well as being redeemed and restored through the Holy Sacrament of Baptism. So we all become adopted children of the Holy Trinity through baptism. But within the Hindu world, there are divisions. Some people have said that the idea of caste is, uh, it, uh, it was something imposed upon the Indian world, or that this uh, idea of a sharp distinction within society is the result of colonization. But if anyone reads the Vedas and anyone reads the Upanishads, or any of the classic texts, it's very clear that caste exists. And, um, and there are two different words for the single word caste, and that may be one of the difficulties, because um, 
there's a word called varna, which isn't exactly caste, but that's, I think, how often in the West we think of it. And basically, a varna is one of the main categories of peoples um, of where they fit into society. So if we go to the next slide, this is an, an image I found on the internet. And um, here we can see there's Brahma, who's understood as like the divine all-encompassing being. And the different castes are said to represent uh, different parts of Brahma's body. So the highest is Brahma's head, where the intellect resides, and this is the priests who pass on knowledge. The next are Brahma's arms, the Kshitriyas, and they are the warriors. And so those are the ones who within Indian society would be princes or rulers, those who put their life at stake for the good of others. And then we see the Vaishyas, and these are uh, represented by the legs. And just as uh, you have to use your legs in order to walk around and sell and buy things or to work in a farm, so they are said to be those parts of Brahma. And their duty is related to the economic life of the country, to agriculture and business. And, um, and then we have the bottom, the Shudras, and those represent the feet. These are craftsmen of different sorts and um, often businessmen who, um, who don't own the business, but you know, sort of work on this lower level. Now, what's interesting is that higher on the list, the Brahmins, although they are given greater social respect, it does not always mean that they're rich. Caste has nothing to do with economic condition. It's very difficult for us Westerners to understand this, but there are poor Brahmins who actually can be employed by Shudra millionaires and yet retain their status. And a Shudra is not allowed to touch a Brahmin or else the Brahmin will be considered ritually unclean. And then the Shudra has to do a penance. A Brahmin might be a cook of a rich merchant but he cannot taste the food that he prepares because Brahmins typically have to um, abstain from all animal meat. Whereas if you're a Shudra, a peasant, you can eat what you like, you can do what you like, you can go where you like, and so they actually have a lot more freedom. Brahmins are required to be monogamous, one, one wife. Shudras can have multiple wives. You see, so the laws for each one and the way they perform ritual the way they have ethics is all determined by their caste. Very difficult for us to grasp this, that an action that might be considered um, sinful by a shudra might not be by a Brahmin or the other way around. And then at the very bottom, we have these two different categories. Uh, and they're both more or less called now untouchables, but they call themselves Dalits or Adivasis. And the idea of untouchable means that ritually, if they were to touch somebody of a higher caste, again, the higher caste person would be expected to purify themselves, perhaps to go to the Ganges River. Uh, and then the Dalit, they would be expected to uh, perform some kind of penance. But as you can imagine, people who are in these social conditions at the very bottom, these are the ones who are given the worst jobs, they're treated the worst, they're given the least social support and they're often uncared for. And so Dalits, uh, their work is sometimes sanitation, cleaning, disposing of dead animals, working with uh, leather or skins, these sorts of things. Now, officially within, um, within the British Raj, when the British were in charge of India in 1938, they passed a law outlawing, outlawing the caste system. So people want to talk about evil colonizers. Well, it was actually the British that tried to remove the caste system from India as a whole. And after Indian independence in 1947, they didn't want to unroll those laws, lest they, work, they, they look worse than the British. And so um, they actually declared the nation to be secular. That was the only way to get around the caste system, was to say that um, it wasn't a, uh, a part of India at all. So that's why officially India is not Hindu because they did not want to return the law to the caste system that the Brits got rid of. Isn't that very interesting? In any case, nevertheless, although it's not on the books, it's practiced everywhere. And in fact, there have been cases, unfortunately, of Christians um, who themselves were Brahmins. So their families go back for centuries and they can identify themselves with that higher caste who, um, when, oops, sorry, there was a, um, 
a, a bishop that was made of a lower caste and the higher caste Christians refused to go to that higher, that, that, that lower caste bishops uh, masses because he's a lower caste. They said, we don't respect it, but they're all Christians. So the issue of caste in India remains and it's very powerful and it is something quite difficult to uh, address. Um, the, the, the other word for caste, and sorry, I know we're, we're getting up here close to time, but the other word for caste in Sanskrit used in Hindi is called jati. <laughs> sorry, David, I know it's complicated. Um, not only are those the major groups that I just mentioned, there are actually hundreds of other smaller groups. In fact, there's one point there, they said there were over 2,000 different Brahmin castes alone. Okay, so just to give you an idea, once again, of the proliferating complexity within India and Hinduism. All right, so we're going to have to move on and just very briefly address some chief ideas that, that are present in most Hindu thought. And these chief ideas is that there's a world behind the veil, namely that right now in this world, everything is an illusion, and that's the word maya that what we see has no true existence. You think you see a tree, you think you're looking at your spouse, you think that you exist. All of that is an illusion that comes about because of your imperfection. And as long as you are imperfect, then you have to go through these eternal cycles of karma. So you can see the wheel here. And the wheel represents how the universe in its present existence will turn over and there will be another universe with another version of you that must come back until you finally escape from this world of illusion, and then you can be dissolved into the one divine being. And so karma then in uh, the Hindu mind helps to explain that there's no real evil. If evil happens to somebody, they deserve it because in their past life, they had done something that deserved evil in this life. and thus. They believe that insects can be a human being. You know, if there's a human being in the past who did evil, they're insects now, or perhaps they can be a sacred cow. Or they believe that even spirits, demons, angels are also versions of the same thing. So, this idea then pervades human uh, Hindu consciousness as this strong sense of the lack of personal self. And there, it's in quite contrast to what we say in Christianity, where you one soul per person, and your soul and your body eventually be reunited and live forever. And um, very briefly, there are six what are called worldviews or philosophies. So this is even more complex. You thought you thought it was confusing with the different ways of worshiping the different gods. Well, these darshanas sometimes again called philosophies, I think it's better to call it a worldview, they have different ways of relating to the ancient texts. So one, the, the Vedanta, they follow the Vedas, the Upanishads, as I mentioned, and I'm not going to talk about the other ones because, well, it's complex and we don't have time, but just to note that yoga is seen as a Hindu darshana. In other words, it's a Hindu philosophy of life, and for yoga, it's not related per se to the worship of any of the gods or to any kind of ritual sacrifice. Instead, it's achieving moksha, remember that liberation, through action. You offer yourself to the divine being through your action. What are those actions? Well, some are ethical actions and others are yoga postures. So this just gives us an idea of how, within the Hindu mind, how yoga fits into it. And sometimes well, people will say, oh, well, yoga is not Hindu, you know, yoga is its own separate thing. Well, the answer is it kind of depends. But in classical Hinduism, it definitely is one of these philosophies. So it's just helpful to know. Um, how do we respond to Hinduism given this <laughs> bewildering complexity, given this great banyan tree with branches that all seem independent and, and yet uh, somehow united? Well, I would just say that there, there are four key ideas that we need to keep in mind. And um, the four key ideas are these. First, there are things that we can know even by um, natural reason. And St. John Henry Newman had a wonderful sermon where he said essentially that 
the recognition that you have a soul and a personal self. He says, if you can grasp that, your eternal soul, which God has made out of nothing at the moment of your conception, if you can grasp that, then you will understand your essence and your destiny. And the next notion is this idea that we have a temporal universe. It's not an eternal circle, it's a line. And the line begins when God creates the universe out of nothing in Genesis, and the final consummation is described in the book of Revelation, that there is one destination ultimately for all of us, either heaven or hell. And your eternal soul will go there based on your relationship with the triune God. And then we can say that there are two other key principles to keep in mind that are quite distinct from the Hindu notion. Namely, that God has become incarnate once. There are not multiple avatars of this divine being. There's one God in the flesh, hypostatically united, and this is Jesus Christ. He is the one personal Savior who has an intellect and a will, human intellect who knows us, human will who chose to suffer for us. He has a divine intellect that knows all things, a divine will that chooses to be in conformity with the Father from all eternity one personal savior who died for all of us. And that one God was a Jewish man. There's no escaping it. And this means that God's entrance into time and into space is rooted in history. And so the Father and the Holy Spirit, not incarnate, but they work eternally in conjunction with Jesus Christ in order to reveal themselves to us so that we might be united to them while retaining our own personal self in that eternity of heaven. Thank you. So, Father Ezra, are you ready for some questions? Awesome. Okay, we're going to start with uh, one from Lauren here. She says, many people, especially art or music therapists, encourage people to listen to Hindu chants or the, the Vedas um, for healing. She said, how should a Catholic approach to listening to these, how should a Catholic approach listening to these chants when they stem from a polyistic worldview? Wow, great question, great question. So um, first, I'm going to advertise a book that's not mine. And, um, and if, you, if you have any questions uh, further, I, I highly recommend this book right here, The Human Icon. Can you see the, the author there? If you just type in The Human Icon, it's available on Amazon. And um, the reason why I like this book is because I, I quoted it a number of times without referencing her. Um, she, uh, the, the woman, Christine Mangala Frost, she grew up as Hindu in India, and then she came to England and eventually converted to Greek Orthodoxy. Now, I, I raise this because she actually talks about this very issue. And one of the things she points out is that there are some chants from uh, some of these texts which are non religious. However, they're almost always within a religious context. And unless you know Hindi or Sanskrit, I think that it's it, you should just assume that they're polytheistic and that they're dangerous. Um, just as I would never recommend for somebody to have, say, in their room, a statue or picture of any of the Hindu gods, neither would I recommend that people listen to any of the chants as a way to relax. Um, in fact, I've known people who've had some Hindu uh, statues of the gods in their rooms and actually attracted demonic spirits to them. And so I would just say just absolutely we should not use this as a means of relaxation. Now, of course, if you're you know, doing study or something like that, I mean, the way that I might, in order to say, well, what do the chants sound like? If you're a musicologist, that's a slightly different issue. But you should never be passive with respect to somebody else's religion and assume that you'll be unaffected. Uh, two things, thank you for another talk that helped me with this, to Christianize those, thank you for that. And that helped me a lot with my back problems. So, but my question is, you said that they came from the North, there was a group that came from the North. So where does the Harappa civilization stands in that history that you gave? of those influences from the north that's my question okay so so the arab the arabs yes so they also came from the north no the harappa the harappa civilization ah uh, oh the, i'm sorry the harappa so 
it it seems that they were already there and and it's it's not clear actually whether they migrated at all um in when we look at the geo history of the world we can see how india may fit into africa i mean we're talking about you know the geological eons before europe was fully formed and before the united states broke off from africa so as far as uh, what I understand is the Harappa people were already there when the Aryans came. And whether the Harappa are older than the Dravidians, it's, it's not really clear to me. Um, but I would just say that it's that they came to mix eventually with these other linguistic and cultural ethnic groups. Father, we'll um, do another question that is coming in quite a bit, um, asking about yoga. So. Um, you just got done with an answer to your question about music and listening to music. So I suppose Catholics should not be doing yoga either. Is that the case? Well, I, I will give, uh, there's a brief answer and there's a long answer. The brief answer is, as we can see, yoga is a part of Hinduism in its roots. The roots of yoga are Hinduism. There's no doubt about that. And because of that, I'd say, if you if you want to avoid the fruit, you have to avoid the root. So Christians should not do yoga. Now, I have a much I'm actually writing a book on the topic of how do Christians approach yoga because it's such a controversial issue. And many people will claim that they can separate certain elements from yoga that are of Hindu origin. And whether or not that's possible is a very complex answer that I actually can't address here. But I'll just say no. Christians can't do yoga as such. Can you do something different? Can you do stretching? Can you do breathing? Yes. How do you do that in a way that respects, um, you know, Christian belief? Well, that sometimes that's a little complicated. So that, that's that's just where I'll leave it for now, though. And, and I purposely like brought up yoga in order to help people to think through its relationship to Hinduism, and then also to note that like it's complex because when we get to Buddhism next week. Well, a lot of Buddhists practice some form of yoga, they'll even say so, and yet they don't believe in Hinduism. Okay, so so the root of yoga is Hinduism, but then we get shoots or, that are Buddhist and shoots that are Western. Okay, so yoga itself is like this flowering tree with all these different branches and, and fruits. So I'll just say though, no yoga. <laughs> all right, good. Well, at least we have a basic answer and we can look forward to when your book comes out. Um, when can we expect that, Father? Um, the fewer talks I give for the ICC, the, <laughs> the faster it'll come out. <laughs> well, then we'll just, we'll be patient then. We'll just be patient. Okay, so Inez's question is, once Hinduism was not so uh, geographically isolated from the rest of the world, how did or did other religions get influenced by Hinduism? Yeah, okay, that, that, that's a great question. And, and I think that there is, I'll, I'll have to say this, and this is related to the yoga question, that we know that Christians encountered Greek pagan philosophy. And, and in fact, Jews, Jews before Christ encountered Greek pagan philosophy. Some of that philosophy is actually somewhat um, integrated with uh, what we call the deuterocanonical books, like the Book of Sirach, the Book of Wisdom. There's definitely some Greek thought in there. It's just, it's undoubtable. Uh, and then when we get to post-Christ, the Church Fathers, they definitely incorporated some elements of Stoicism, Aristotelian thought, Platonic thought. There's no doubt about it. Everybody agrees on this. However, it's been a centuries-long process to purify those philosophies from um, their, their pagan origins and from the falsehoods and errors that they have. Okay, so, so, so Christianity is always in the process of trying to find what is true and good and trying to incorporate that into itself because we have this assimilative power since we come from God who is the source of all truth. But nevertheless, to do so is no easy or quick thing. Okay, so there are a lot of people who, uh, Christians who write about Hinduism and um, basically they become syncretistic which means that they think that you can have like Christian Hinduism and you can't. There's no way whatsoever. We don't worship multiple gods. Those other gods are not versions of Christ. There's one God. However, there are elements of wisdom in India, in India and in Hindu writings that perhaps we can learn from. 
And I would just say it's, we have to be very cautious with that. But um, uh, for instance, remember I was talking about the um, Arthashastras, the um, uh, uh, books on success and po politics. There are actually elements of those Arthashastras that were read by uh, British colonists in the 17 and 1800s. And it actually affected the way that the Brits ran their colonies. They said, wow, this is a really valuable way to understand the organization of society. We need to recognize the, the principle that we Catholics would call subsidiarity, but basically it's like having local people uh, being in charge of things. And, um, and I think there's a lot of stuff like that, which has nothing to do with religion, but we can still learn from. So th that's, that's the beginning of an answer, uh, Inez. Uh, Norman, go ahead with your question. Take yourself off a of mute. All right. Hi, Father. Uh, thank you for a wonderful, wonderful talk. Um, you just brought me back to junior high school. Uh, we took everything that you mentioned as, as a project for our, our sociological, uh, sociologies of the last. Um, you mentioned that Christianity is, is assimilative. Um, would it be correct to assume now that Hindu, Hinduism is basically an accommodation of different beliefs, different religions, because you mentioned a while ago that um, sometimes they have all these Hindu gods and then they have the picture of Jesus along with the rest of the gods. So would it be correct to say that this uh, Hinduism is you know, ba basically an accommodation of all religions and they got all mismatched into, into one? Yeah, that, that, that's a good question. Um, I, I, I think that's correct that essentially, because, because as Christians, Jesus Christ gives us the source of truth. Remember the, uh, when the Pharisees said, he speaks as one having authority and not as the scribes. And so this, this is always for us the principle that actually Christ and then Christ's teachings continued and developed through the church and especially with the infallibility of the Pope and the magisterium when they speak authoritatively. This has always helped Christians to distinguish truth from falsehood. And we have very clear lines. And sometimes we have to say, anathema if you believe this. And other times we can say, well, there's multiple options of what to believe in this regard. You know, the followers of St. Thomas Aquinas or of uh, the Franciscans, Duns Scotus, you have multiple philosophies. So, so Christians um, nowadays are often criticized for having black and white categories and for saying this is Christian and this isn't Christian and people say, oh, well, that's, that's really intolerant. And we would say, well, we tolerate all truth. <laughs> okay, and now that's different. That's different from the Hindu perspective because the Hindu perspective does not have a central authority to speak definitively. Nor did, as I said, although most of them accept the Vedas, not even there are all the Vedas accepted equally. And so I, I like the way that you put it, Norman, is that they accept multiple things. And instead of assimilating to the truth, they sort of arrange them in sort of parallel lines. And, and there's no notion that one has to decide or that there's any ultimate truth there. Because everything is all ultimately for them one in this divine being. There's ultimately, is there really truth or error? Is there really good or evil? It's pretty difficult to make those claims. All right, Father, we'll wrap up with this. And I apologize to everyone. There are so many good questions that came in, but um, in the interest of, of wanting to um, be you know, um, respectful of, of Father's time, we'll, we'll close it out with this question. Um, Father, in view of the unofficial, as you put it, uh, caste system in India, how do Hindus view um, St. Mother Teresa and the missionaries of charity who obviously are, are serving the least of these in India? Yes, excellent question. Um, so, so first, of course, we have to say, it's not like there's a universal perspective. Just as if we said, what do Americans think of Mother Teresa. Well, <laughs> there's going to be quite a variety. If you remember in, in the West, uh, who was it? Was it Richard Dawkins? Somebody um, really criticized Mother Teresa and said that she was a, a crook and a hoax and so on. Okay, so nevertheless, what, what I would say is, um, I think the question is, is trying to ask from a caste perspective, because Mother Teresa was picking up out of the gutter, the untouchables, 
which would make her ritually unclean, then how, how do they understand that? And, and actually, I would say um, this is the beauty of the challenge of Christ, because everyone can recognize this as an action of love and of goodness. It's undoubtable, and it challenges the very foundations of the caste system. And so some would say, well, that's good for her, but I would never do it because I'm Brahmin. But others say, you know, what she's doing is good for everybody, and I should, I should love my neighbor that much. And so it, this, is, this is one of the reasons why, on the one hand, she's loved throughout the world, and then she creates this sort of tension within uh, the Hindu mindset, and even within India, is um, it's pretty hard for Indians to say they don't like Mother Teresa when the world loves her, and when she's recognized as having produced this, this heroic charity. And yet at the same time, um, while well, they don't want people to convert to Christianity, and they also don't like their, you know, the caste system challenged. So, so it create, I call it the creative tension that, that Christ brings into our world. But wow, Father, this has been just a fascinating time with you today, and I'm sure folks are so ready for next week already um, to uh, learn about Buddhism from you. Um, but we will leave it there for now and look forward to next time. So uh, could you, would you mind closing us in prayer, Father? Absolutely. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thy intercession was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, we fly into thee, O Virgin of Virgins, our Mother. To thee do we come, before thee we stand, sinful and sorrowful. O Mother of the Word incarnate, despise not our petitions, but in thy clemency, hear and answer us. St. Teresa of Avila, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Mm -hmm.